Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of Contact Loss, the best Polish English speaking podcast about Warhammer 40k competitive scene, I guess. I'm sure. Anyway, uh, I'm Tweak, your host today. No Joker, but he will join us for the next episodes, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Um, today, we start a new series of episodes. Uh, the series is going to pertain to the World Team Championships. Uh, I don't know if you know, but we are going to be doing the studio coverage of that from Belgium or while in Belgium in Mechelen, uh, right there with the guys playing the game. So we will be delivering the, all the latest news and so on. But since we are starting a new series, a new series requires a special guest and the guest you can see the guest on the screen already you've seen the title of the episode but i need to do the proper introduction so today i give you well let me start with this they say that john lennon from the art of war is the boy king now <laughs> today i give you the man king i give you the king of thing of kings the Rex Mundi. Mm. I give you Lord Liam of the House Hackett. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. My word. That sounded like the opening of like a magnum opus or some sort of like narcissistic yeah. uh, bibliography if, or something. <laughs> if you were a lady, I would call you Khaleesi, but you know, I cannot go there. So. <laughs> no, thanks for that. That was awesome. All right. So welcome to the to the show. I brought you in for the obvious reason that might not be obvious to all the listeners, because I assume there will be people who have not heard of the WTC. There will be people who, uh, well, obviously have not been to the WTC. Uh, so I invited you and I called you the king, my liege, sire, because uh, last year you managed to win both the singles event at the World Team Championships and the team championship as well. So you took both trophies home. I don't know if that's if that has ever happened before, but yeah, I like I I forgot to check that. But um, how did that feel? So let's start with this. Like you know, have you been basking in the <laughs> sun of glory and so on for the entire so year? Or? Yeah. I, I think probably the the more important thing, um, rather than winning, was the the fact that uh, any photos or videos of me following WTC was basically photos of a corpse um, because of how fatigued I appear. There was actually a large number of memes about that. You know the, the the TV show for kids, Arthur, where like there's a particular like picture of he's got like the big bags around his eyes. There's a photo of me where I look like Arthur in that photo. I was honestly completely oh. shattered because you know it's um. Uh, eight or so games of singles 40k yeah. um there's no days break if you play the the finals and then seven days of team uh, seven um rounds of team 40k for a total of 15 games of competitive 40k and four hour rounds over something like five and a half six days and um that is a uh, i've got to be honest that is a monumental like endurance feat. Tall, I'm sure. um yeah. so after wtc and a week of sleeping um, it's actually a lie. I went back to work the day I landed. Uh, the day I landed home, so that, that, that was pretty rough. But um, no, it, it was obviously the highlight of you know my time playing 40k. Uh, I was re I thought it was really privileged in general to go. Um, w without I guess digressing too much, for the Aussies to go to WTC is actually like it, you know it's a literally a cross world journey. Um, there's very few places that we can go that are further away than Europe for us. Um, you know, it's, and it costs uh, an arm and a leg as well. So yeah, it's about about a five thousand Australian dollar trip, and it's a thirty two hour journey. Um, uh, uh, you know, to get there. So the whole way home was obviously flying high, metaphorically and literally. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, and I was really, I think I was really privileged in the sense that we'd been trying really really hard for a really long time you know w without i guess being crass or, or anything like that to make aussie 40k be respected i think um you know we we, we we've always thought that uh, we have a different take um we have a lot of really really good players uh who i don't think really get recognized um and i was so happy to come back with a 
metaphorical trophy. There wasn't a physical trophy um, that we, <laughs> with uh, the metaphorical trophies for, you know, the singles event for myself, which was awesome, the, the, the team event, but also we won best sports as well. Um, yeah, they stole that from uh, Canada. <laughs> uh, we do, we do, I'm not sure how we manage that. We are generally abrasive people. Um, but uh, we, I think the best part of, you know, apart from painting, uh, which we would never win, uh, we won everything, which was really, really awesome. So before we get into uh, Team Australia, uh, let's just talk about the WTC for a, for a wee bit. Uh, so what makes a team of Aussies get on the plane the, as, as, as you said, the, the, the price of the tickets or the, the amount of money that you had to pay for the tickets probably could feed a small village for a year. So <laughs> it, it costs a lot. And then, you know, you go to a team event like that. Uh, you don't know whether you're going to win or lose, obviously, because yeah. the competition is quite uh, rough. So, yeah, what, 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 what drives you? Uh, is it the WTC itself? Is there something special about it? Or is it the camaraderie with the team and you would go to the end of the world with them? Um, so I think it's a bit of both, uh, mm. probably leaning more towards the fact that, it, you know, it is the WTC. So for, for us, I think Aussies in general, I definitely put myself in this category, think that Team 40K is the only 40K. Like I, I like singles events. I, I enjoy playing singles events, but I think they're a, a secondary show to the team game because from my perspective, this game, we love it. Look, I have far too much of my house insurance probably dedicated to covering my 40K if everything burns down. Like, I'm definitely invested, right? But the reality is, is that this game will never be balanced. It's never, ever going to be balanced. It's never going to be perfect. But Teams irons a lot of that stuff out. Teams is a format where, you know, you're encouraged to work together, to plan more. Um, and at the end of the day, if the game is horrifically unbalanced, it's horrifically unbalanced for every team because any elements yeah. you can include across factions, across teams, sorry. So we love teams. And frankly, I think the WTC is the premier teams event. It's having only one team from each nation sort of um, encourages like a hierarchical system in the sense that like people want to level up, so to speak, to like join the team and travel, which is a whole separate ball game. I also think, on the one hand, and perhaps this is Aussie psychology, the fact that it's so far away and the fact that it's so removed from everything else in Australia is really appealing for us because, you know, you you travel as a team, you stay as a team, you drink far too many Primus beers as a team. You know, we, we absolutely love it because you, you, it's almost like the ultimate boys trip <laughs> in, yeah, in many absolutely. ways, you know, and it's a it's a really great thing to, I guess, look forward to and aspire to join. So, so for us, we, we are gluttons for WTC and Australia in general. I'm really, really happy that, you know, even in the last, I think, four or five years, Australia has adopted more and more of that WTC enthusiasm far outside of like the, the the top players or the even the top competitive tournaments. Your friendly local gaming store, like I, there's a store here in Annerley near where I live that's you know a, a basement hobby shop essentially that has WTC style terrain. Um, and you know the the adoption of WTC terrain, map packs, and obviously we're in a new edition now with tenth, which I'm sure we'll touch on. But you know in ninth. They were using the full WTC FAQ, even for like little RTTs and stuff. In fact, the only place that wasn't using WTC in my home city was the Games Workshops, <laughs> the, the, the actual is, shop. Yeah, which is understandable. Yeah. So, you know, th there is a growing, like ever growing, ever enhancing WTC culture here on the bottom of the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, last year, uh, I remember like a month or two months before the WTC. I'm I'm a glutton for podcasts. And yours is one that I devour. Like whenever there is an episode, I, <laughs> I, I immediately turn it on. I, I walk my dogs a lot, so there's a plenty of time to to listen to it. And a year ago, your podcast was not that popular in Poland. I you know, maybe a handful of people knew who the normal blogs are. And then you know, at some point when our team was like gathering intel and so on, I was like, dude, guys, do you, have you heard of those guys? <laughs> One, 
it's an amazing podcast. Like it's it's fun to listen to. The the people over there have amazing chemistry. And two, they really seem to know what they are talking about. <laughs> so and after after the event, like when you won, I had like twenty people come to me and say, Hey, what was that podcast that you were talking about? Like we would like to, <laughs> you know, listen more to it and so on. Because now people have actually noticed that there is something else on the 40k map global 40k map different to the uk and the united states and it's australia so it's well very done. far away from both of us <laughs> it is but you know skill wise it's i would say from what we have seen it's skill wise in ingenuity wise because your lists the lists that you brought to the event uh they were like unlike anything people have seen before and they caught many people by surprise which is Actually, I'll use this as a segue to one of the questions that I have. So, when I listened to your podcast uh, last year, I think you were talking about your preparations and the mistakes, or sorry, the lessons learned that you took away from the 2019 WTC. And one of the things that I can't remember if it was you or Eric or someone else, uh, someone said that I think it was Eric playing a game against someone in the singles event and there was either John Lennon or someone else maybe Sean Naden who came to the table sat sat next to the table and was watching the entire game to try and figure out what the list does yes yeah in 2022 you were smarter than that from what I know <laughs> and you took completely different lists to yes. singles and completely different lists to um to the teams event so the question will be people recognize you for the ingenuity the, the the originality of your list and so on but this year when we have the 10th edition everyone will have original lists do you think that this takes away some edge from you or is it actually something that you're looking forward to um so i'm definitely the latter i'm i'm really really enthusiastically looking forward to it and the, the reason is this is that i think that um true on one hand everyone's on a level playing field in the sense that we're all digesting the indexes and whatnot but i also think that the simplified not simple uh catchphrase means that overall i think there will be less combos like, like if, if you read the indexes it's definitely um less complicated than the relics stratagems detachments combos we had in the previous edition and so i think that there will be some clear winners right yeah, and I feel like in the context of there being some clear winners, where the Australians, are, I think, excel is working out the counters and the combos to the clear winners rather than just bringing the clear winners. And I, I'm really excited, for example, not to read an index and go, Death Watch veterans good. You know, like I'm because like, you know, I, I think that's a that's a really hot take. Um, I'm sure Reddit will tell me all about that. But what I'm very, very excited to do is actually work out how to beat that. And I think, you know, that was that was and remains but actually my favorite part of 40K um, and is why I why I actually, even when other people are having their whole salt shakers and like throwing them around, I consistently get enthusiastic about 40K because mm. I find everything, I see everything as a productive challenge. Like you, you will you will show me a list I don't know, three Wraith Knights and a whole bunch of D cannons for the, the new Eldar. And I look at it and I go, cool, how am I going to beat this? Because I don't go, oh, how am I going to beat this and be all sad and down about it? I genuinely ask myself the challenge, how am I going to beat this? Because I want to do it. I want to make it happen. And the Aussies in general are like that. We, we like taking down something that's powerful, um, whether that's whether that's Wraith Knights or whether that's the United States. We, we, like, we, we, we like both. Um, and from from my perspective i think that uh especially going into a new edition it's a twofold boon for aussies in the sense that um now everyone's in the aussie camp in the sense that there's no meta for people to replicate <laughs> like yeah, there, like like there's no net I think, <laughs> exactly I, I, and i do think it's fair to say that even at the wtc there is a reasonable amount of net listing but like, like I, I think that, and that that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's more an observation that I think that there are things that are inherently powerful and that are established as having a track record. And there are teams and people who rely on those sort of armies alongside their skill to achieve results. But I think that that crutch is largely taken away now. There is no net list. 
or there might be some you know preliminary net lists but we don't know how that actually holds up um and so i think the the aussie strength is has always been adaptability and the fact that we might rock up with eight armies that you know none of them are death watch veterans and people mm. might you know people might think that's madness but there's always a plan you know like, yeah um so taking all that into consideration and you being the captain of the of the national team if i understand correctly you will be deeply involved in building the team or maybe the yeah. team is built already uh, regardless what is the process of getting the people because you mentioned that and i mentioned that as well like you know ingenuity adaptability is that something that you specifically look for in your candidates or is yeah. it more faction specialists or is it more you know maybe you have so such um let's say so experienced players that they could take anything give them two weeks and they will be able to play literally anything even yeah. weeks before the event so what is the so, process yeah um whilst this might sound like i'm running for parliament i have a pretty political answer to that question um <laughs> and, and the answer is all of the above uh so when i'm looking for candidates especially because it was it was pretty clear early on that we were going to be playing 10th edition even though wtc did a captain's vote and whatnot uh, i went into the team selection process even last november i thought you see with the expectation we'd be playing 10th edition and i'm glad i did because here we are um and because of that player skill is incredibly important to me results are incredibly important to me but more than that i needed people who um for example i, I needed people who i've always seen to be creating their own lists because one of the problems that I foresaw is that some of the best players, um, and I, I'm sure Australia is not unique to this, but some of the best players um, around are consistently playing armies that are already established, that kind of you know, net listing with some slight adjustments. And whilst I think that's, that's totally fine from a singles perspective, playing a team event in an entirely new edition requires psychology for you to actually sit down, read an index and have the, the patience to read every profile, every special rule, every combo, like you're reading a novel. True. And so, and so I, I really, I selected people who, I'm not even gonna use the term faction mastery anymore, not because I wanna avoid the, the arguments that come mm -hmm. with that, but, but more that, you know, I think about faction enthusiasm now because no one has mastery of any factions. 10th edition is so different. But for example, people like Chris Wright on Team Australia, he's a Marine and Eldar enthusiast. This man would sniff Kalgar's armor dust if he possibly could. And so when the rules come out for Marines and Eldar, I trust that I'm going to wake up at eight o'clock in the morning and he's already read every data sheet. He's already read every single rule that can come out. And he he's not sending me that, oh, D cannons are good when you roll a six, like whoop de doo What he's sending me is that you can do this awesome combo when you combine your know, ranges and blah, blah, blah. That's the stuff that I miss. And so I'm looking for people with faction enthusiasm, uh, adaptability, and also, sure, like individual player skill. But I actually think that third point, the individual player skill, is arguably the least relevant because I don't know about you, um, Tweak, but I, I've played a couple of games of 10th edition. I know we don't have really points yet, but mm -hmm. I've played a couple of games and I feel like the training wheels on <laughs> in the sense that like I, I don't, the muscle memory of the things I used to do is all gone. Yeah, because, you know, everything is so fresh. Everything is so new. Everything is so different. But again, I'll use what you just said. Um, as a segue to another question, um, because I haven't played a game of 10th yet, uh, simply because of lack of time. But uh, I do follow a lot of podcasts. I do follow shit ton of YouTube channels as well. So I saw some games. I just finished watching, uh, I think, Vanguard Tactics playing Sisters versus Death Guard uh, yeah. because I wanted to check out Death Guard, which is like my go to army, uh, has been recently. Um, so, but most of those channels look at the game from the perspective of singles. So they look yes. at the game from the perspective of, you know, how how do I perform individually? How do you think will tenth play out for teams? So there are, you know, there Ooh. are so many 
so many aspects that need to be taken into account. Uh, how are you approaching this as a captain's team? So, um, how I'm approaching it, I suppose, it is uh, in a reasonably flowcharty kind of manner, in the sense that uh, there are some basic questions that I don't yet have answers to. And mm -hmm. by that, I mean like what the overall damage profiles of things look like, how killy is stuff in general, how durable is stuff in general. Um, you know, to, to put it in perspective, like I played a game um, literally yesterday, a Thousand Suns versus Space Marines, and we basically found that something like 60% of our damage was mortal wounds both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but both Space Marines with like onslaught Gatling cannons that all do mortal wounds on sixes, and then mm -hmm. Thousand Suns where like everything seems to do mortal wounds on sixes. So um, I'm still trying to establish where my baseline is. And I say that because, for example, if we work out that, you know, so many things do mortals, but infantry are particularly vulnerable to it, I, I can perceive this addition being a more mechanized addiction. Uh, yeah, does, addition, like not addiction. Um, where definitely an addiction as well, but <laughs> not, not quite the one we're talking about. Um, yeah. So in terms of team like construction and how 10th is going to look there's a lot of unknowns i don't think i can really answer that question with much like veracity i suppose mm -hmm. um i think that from what i've seen from the data sheets the way damage works uh and i would argue the extremes of durability and damage which despite the fact that i think games workshop explained that it was going to be like a less killy edition i think that there are things that are for example, some of the profiles, if you put into ninth edition, would instantly be the mm -hmm. best weapon in, in the edition, like straight away. Um, I think that it's going to be a really polarizing edition of 40k. Um, I think that there's more of a role in teams for skew armies mm -hmm. um, than ever oh, yeah. before. And I also think that the one thing that I can't answer yet, that's a really big unknown for, for Team Australia, and I'm presuming the world, um in terms of wtc is the terrain uh because the terrain rules are vastly different um arguably more interactive slash more restrictive depending on how you look at it and how we approach that and uh, even list design full stop mm. is gonna vary wildly depending on the terrain rules Sim simple things like demon princes i mean with the changes to how fly works you can't just put a demon prince in the corner of a ruin and fly it over. Yeah. So so does that mean, for example, I'm probably going to want to take more infantry sorcerers as a Thousand Suns player than demon princes because they're way more mobile just because they can move mm -hmm. through ruins? We don't know yet. And you can hide them in units as well. Exactly. We, we don't know. There's so many unknowns. We don't know if WTC will play bottom floor blocked, as has been rumored. We don't know if WTC are going to have triangle bases or square bases on their ruins. We don't know if they'll have any bases on their ruins. We don't know the density of the terrain and, and so on and so forth. So in terms of a team's lineup and a team's dynamic, I think the game is going to be very polarizing, but there's so many unanswered questions. Uh, Tom, I, I, I really, I really, I guess, um, every day, you know, refreshing the Warhammer community page, being like, give me more rules. Um, and I, I go to the WTC captain's page and I'm like, give me more rules. Like, you know, I, like I, I, I I feel like at this point I'm I'm rattling my phone wanting to get more info out of it, but I just can't. Yeah, we all we all are. But um I guess and that a little bit off putting bit I mean on one hand off putting on, on the other hand, ma many people are probably looking forward to it, is the release date, designers commentary, FAQ, oh, you yeah. name it, because there there are so many questions right now. Uh, you know, damage yeah. reduction to zero, um fly. Does this does, like has someone made a mistake or is it actually supposed to to work like that? Uh, and so many more. So uh, we'll see whether this turns everything upside down. But let's focus on the things that that are tangible that we can yep. um, that we can see. So first of all, uh, do you feel that the amount of time that you have as a team to prepare is just right, too short, or you know, I guess there's not no other choice. But do you think you have sufficient time to actually pre hmm. prepare for an event of that magnitude that's a good question um i'm gonna say yes and i'm gonna say yes because of probably two maybe three things depending on how rambly i get um the the first is that there's actually almost no singles events between like now for us 
and WTC. Because of that, I think all of my players can put 110% of their time and effort into WTC. And I think realistically, like, I think by Monday, after all the indexes and points dropped, I'll have eight to, I'll have probably about 16 or so lists in my inbox. Mm -hmm. um, so like, like, you know, I think the, the enthusiasm of the Aussies is really high and the energy is really high, especially with some of the new players we've brought to the team this year. I'm really proud of how enthusiastic and energetic they are. Um, I also think that the lack of singles events plays into, I guess, this narrative, whether it's true or not, time will tell that um, the Aussies thrive in an environment where we can like innovate and come up with new things. Um, the fact that there's no singles events means there's nothing for anyone to copy. Um, it's all got to be kind of from the ground up construction um, of lists and, and indeed a team. So I actually feel like those two factors play a positive role for us. Um, the last thing as well is that for me anyway, um, apart from a few 10th games, I haven't played a 40k game since April. Um, I, I actually just, when I knew 10th was coming and WDC was coming, I focused on fundraising and getting ready for 10th and there's a couple and going of, on holidays <laughs> oh yeah that's true and going on my honeymoon as well which is nice exactly. um but um if you heard that it's my wife wooing in the background <laughs> so, um anyway um so you know i think that for me anyway i have a lot of banked energy for for um uh 10th edition and i know a couple of the guys are in the same boat so we might only have a couple of weeks to work out a team but uh i can play like six games a week so um i'm you know it, it's it's going to be an intense period that's for sure yeah at that, at that level is, it always is so it, it comes as no surprise so again uh focusing on the things that are at hand's reach uh, poland as a country is mm -hmm. used to, I mean, you know, has a long history of going to the ETC slash WTC. So Polish Highest players, on average ratings for a team. Yep. Yeah. Let's not go there. I just wanted to focus on, you know, um, uh, that little bit that we played through multiple editions and multiple systems like, you know, submission systems like the, the ninth edition or eighth edition ITC style missions. But people are here are also used to playing a uh, male storm of war. Uh, like it was the bread and butter yeah. at some point, other teams like team America, for example, I imagine, uh, who historically have been playing ITC for a longer while. I guess they had to put in some extra effort into preparing for the WTC yeah. because they, they were not accustomed to using cards. How does that look with your team? I mean, uh, are your, players experienced in using cards is the mission system going to take you by surprise or are we already you know um data crunching it and already getting familiarized with it yeah uh, i think i think the latter I, I think it's quite nostalgic for a lot of aussies like um you know as you mentioned before my first international 40k tournament was um the etc uh in serbia in 2019 um and that was of course a, you know a maelstrom of war um the event it you know wtc included that i have you know to be perfectly honest lusted after maelstrom cards and player placed objectives for the entirety Same of here. ninth edition um like i i have i think at least once a tournament uh, i've just had my grumpy old man moment where i've been like oh, i miss when i used to be able to place down objectives old man you, yells at cloud basically <laughs> you, you damn kids and you're 15 inches 10 inches from the board edge objectives anyway yeah. um and i think that you know, this edition, it kind of is, is my wish list in many ways. Um, there's a lot of different primaries with, I believe, two of them where you can place the objectives. So not everything I wanted, but a little bit. And the Maelstrom cards, I, I would argue, are, the, are, you know, the best they've ever been. You have quite a bit of control over them. There's only like 15 of them. So, you, you know, it's a bit more predictable and able to be tracked. Um, and from my perspective, you know, seven... I can confirm that seven out of eight of the Australian players have played ETC style missions in the past extensively. Um, right. The last, the last fellow is more new to 40k. Um, uh, so from that perspective, I don't think they're surprised at all. Okay. So how about again? We're, we're I, I want to. What's the expression? Uh, 
beat on the topic of predictability. No, I'll, I'll stick Strike to Strike the, the iron while it's hot? Perhaps. Okay, never mind. Predictability. Let's focus on that because <laughs> you said that the, with the cards, it, there there is a f like an amount of things that you can do to make them more predictable. Yep. Uh, but then, again, as a captain, during the games, you probably want to know how the games are going, how yep. uh, you know how many how how many points people can bring from those games because that's the usual thing that the captain does. Um, don't you think that the predictability at a team's event is going to be in a much different place than it used to be because one randomness of the missions to battle shocked, which to me seems like something that could completely turn around, <clears throat> sorry, a turn or even a game because suddenly you don't score objectives, suddenly you lose a unit because you cannot use like a protective stratagem on them or something. Yep. And then you also have um, the gambits that I don't know if anyone is going to use, but they are there and they could also swing the game that way or yep. that way. So how are you going to tackle this? Um, so another very good question. Um, I, I suppose I'll start with the, the the second half of your question first. Uh, like, you know, how are we going to tackle this? And the problem at the moment, we can't. I say that because because we're playing a new edition and everything's in flux. We don't know at WTC if the brackets are going to be the same. Like in ninth edition, it was zero to five points was a draw. And then every five points after that was like 11, 9, 12, 8, so on and so forth. We don't know if those brackets are going to stay the same. And so the um, being able to track games or at least, you know, spot variants, I suppose, in our predicted scores is not possible because we currently don't have the metric to measure games by. Um, for argument's sake, if it stays the same, let's say zero to five, I agree with you that I think there's more room for swing. But I also think it's kind of interesting. I've only played a couple of games, so please bear in mind that everything I'm saying now might be proven in time to be completely ridiculous. And I'm like, yeah, but um, most of the missions are all just five objective missions in the standard, like sweep and clear layout, right? 15 inches from the short board edge and 10 from the long board edge. Now, because there's five objectives, Battleshock from my, it was interesting. Battleshock is impactful, but because you always you only do Battleshock checks in your own command phase, and you always have a CP in your own command phase. Like you always get one at the start of your command phase. I found that you're mainly playing over those three objectives in the middle, unless you're crushing your opponent or getting crushed. And so whenever you fail to check on one of those middle objectives, you just auto pass Battleshock. Um, it did mean obviously you didn't have access for CP for other stratagems, sure. But primary is now half of the, it's more than half of the points because it goes 50 for primary, 40 for secondaries, and 10 for paint. So if you're giving up primary to do reroll hits and wounds stratagem, you're, you're a silly person. I'm sorry, I think you're a silly person. So um, the, the reality is, is that I didn't find that Battleshock actually provided the swing that I thought it would. It more provided a CP drain, what was kind of my, my, my experience with that. Um, in terms of, how we're going to track that as we go. I think that quite a lot of work will probably have to be done um, on getting people used to how a uh, snowball -y primary can be. F from, you know, again, from my perspective, from my games, there's a turn where even if you hold your home field objective, if your opponent holds the middle objectives, they get 20 primary points in a turn. So that theoretically means you can get the 50 points in like two and a half turns, turn two and turn three. So that, you know, there is definitely a world where games can still snowball, but equally some games are quite close. I haven't quite worked out what that variance will be, but you highlighted that the Maelstrom, or sorry, the tactical card system, the secondary objective system to use GW's nomenclature <laughs> is, um, you know, a bit more random. So it provides some variance. It's interesting, sure, it does, but there's only like 15 cards. It's not the old deck of like 36 Maelstrom cards where you can draw like Slay the Warlord turn one. There's 15 cards and three of them can't be scored in the first battle round. So you redraw those cards if you draw them. You also have a CP to discard. And some of the secondary, some of the mission conditions, sorry, allow you to draw three cards, for example, and discard one or three cards and keep all three. So from from my perspective, anyway, my theory is that most good players 
will be approaching maximum secondary in every game that they play and that the, the game will be decided by primary. My theory is that list construction and design will be flexible enough that you just do the Maelstrom cards because they're all readily achievable, to be perfectly honest, and they're not random enough that you can't go, oh, I drew behind enemy lines. I can't do that. I mean, it's like one in 10 chance, right? Like if, you know, it's not particularly unreasonable. Whereas primary is going to be where the game's decided. And how about the the change to, again, I haven't read all the machines, so I, I yeah, yeah. be getting that right. But uh, from what I've seen, there is at least one mission, maybe more, where you place the objectives. It's not like a yeah. preset map, but you place them. Will your players, for example, know how to use that tactically to their advantage yeah. and how to you know, counter whatever the other team is trying to do with their objectives? So I think there's definitely a bit of refreshing to do, but again, almost all of these players are ETC experienced players from about so four or five years ago. Found that in the past. Um, you know, my for, for me, I have longed after this for a long time. I, I absolutely, I absolutely live for the day that I win a game before we deploy armies. Um, you know, I, 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 I have, like, I think it's, I'm so excited for it. And I know people like uh, Matt Morazzoli, Chris Wright, Jeremy Martino are all people who are so excited to be placing objectives mm -hmm. again. Honestly, I, I think the rounds where we'll be placing objectives, because um, I presume there'll be some of that at WTC, um, you will see some very excited Aussies. Okay. And, uh, you know, for, again, people who might not have that much of uh, team play experience, WTC is, well, most of the tournaments, like eight-man tournaments, although there are not so many of them in the world, um, they have this system where when you do your uh, pairing with the other team, you know who's playing who, or, well, you're, you're attempting to uh, establish that, who will be playing who. Um, what you need to take into consideration is like the structure of terrain on the tables because yeah. there are tables that are very terrain dense and then there are tables that have well not 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 little terrain but there are you know shooting alleys that you can take advantage of if you play like a um, a shooty army for example do you know because i don't but do you know whether the wtc is planning to do something like this in this year in this edition as well or are they going to stick to the generic gw sort of terrain suggestions to make it easier for everyone to adapt oh um so i think there's probably from what i've heard anyway mm -hmm. uh to answer wtc specifically there's like a ideal world versus a practical world scenario which is very reasonable in the sense that you know we are planning it's going to be something like 128 tables or something like that you of know, 40k terrain teams of eight people so math yeah something like sorry that. Uh, yeah 100 and, yeah 128 i think is what it wait mm -hmm. regardless it, it's a large Ish. number of 40k tables and the reality is is that we have very little time to test lists and terrain let alone manufacture terrain to actually fit exactly. uh, the addition and so i think there's a reasonable world um where um we get wtc terrain slap some like as it is now in ninth edition slap some bases on it and say bob's your uncle and so it probably won't look anything like the games workshop maps which from memory too far i've never played a game on a games workshop terrain map um but they look like the enormous squares in the middle of the table um like the four really big squares. I don't think it'll. I don't think WTC will look like that. I hope it won't look like that. Um, fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, Liam, I'll take a minute of your time because I need to announce something, uh, and then we'll come back to. I have a couple more questions, but I need to announce something to our listeners, and uh, that is, everyone. I would like you to 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 know this that contact lost. So myself and Joker, we are going to be in Belgium. I mentioned that already. We are going to be covering the WTC from where it happens. Uh, and we are going to do this in the form of a something like a sports studio. So essentially, we're going to be there for you for the first hour of the game, and probably the last hour of the game. Um, and we are going to be accompanied by Nathan from StatsCheck, who is going to, do, going to be doing the data crunching for us. And there's going to be Typhus, also from StatsCheck, who is going to be running around the field with his phone, sending us the latest info about the stuff that is going on. So you will be getting all the latest stuff 
all the latest information from our studio. So make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, just click on that bell button and so on, because there is one more thing that we are going to be doing. And you all, Liam, you as well, uh, could be really interested in that. And this is uh, probably somewhere around, somewhere after the list submission time, Joker and myself, we are going to be doing the live group draw. So we are going to have, like, think of the UEFA style glass balls with, you know, a lot of balls in them. We are going to actually do that for you. So that's going to happen live on our channel, WPC channel and so on. So stay tuned for that. Um, I don't know the exact date yet, but that is definitely coming. We are going to be covering that as the official partner for the WTC. So make sure that you are there to see it. Make sure that you follow us uh, and you get the latest notification when that pops up. Um, and yeah, the series that we are doing right now, it's going to last until the very event. So uh, the intention is to speak to the top 10 teams from last year, plus the four, the four new teams, and if time allows, also the United Nations teams, because as far as I know, there are going to be two. So yeah. uh, they used to be called mercenaries because they are like an assortment of individuals who either don't have a national team or didn't get selected but still want to go so there is a lot to explore there and we will try to do that as well sorry liam for that this brings me to my next question which is um there are four new countries at the at the wtc south africa israel cyprus new zealand are you prepared to face them do you know anything about them are you collecting intel about them um New Zealand, yes, yes, and yes, mm -hmm. uh, because they are literally next door. Um, but and you know, for us, the New Zealand team are you know known operatives, so to speak. They came to the uh, the ANZ TC, the Australian and New Zealand Team Championships, which is our equivalent of the ATC. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we we're aware of those players. Um, we talk to them like they're their mates. Um, so. Yes, we're aware for, for that team. The other teams, I'm going to be honest, no. One of the things that you know, I want to add a caveat there is that um, my strength as a 40K player is definitely not like my hardcore, my weakness. And it comes into my work as well, to be perfectly honest, is my memory for names is just like literally non existent. Um, and unfortunately, being a doctor, that's very problematic, but I'm Aussie, so I can call people mate, which is really helpful. Um, but what that means is, for example, like I look at a tournament, especially an international tournament, and like, you know, I, I read names and I'm just like, I literally know zero of these people. And that's actually not true. Like a couple of them are people I've played, spoken to, had drinks with, and even like whole meals with. I'm just really bad with names. However, people like Matthew Morazzoli, for example, and um, our head coach this year, Denise, are really great info gatherers they are people who um can you know not just remember and know a lot of people internationally but um you know know what lists they've played know what factions they've played know their success in singles or other teams tournaments and so i trust trust in my ability as a captain to delegate uh the various spy network to other other players because i've got it's not my strength uh, i'm really bad at it so yeah, gathering intel is that important part of preparation for the WTC to anyone who might think that it's not happening. Wake up. Uh, it, it, Look, it, is. It, it, it is happening. But but again, I, I think the, the weird part about 10th edition is that what intel is there to gather, right? You know, like, like there's, there's that. I'm, I'm assuming, right, that there are going to be zero team events between now and WTC where any of the WTC players reasonably play their army sorry between now and list sub i'm going to add that caveat because i am literally going to a team event the week after list sub um mm -hmm. down in new south wales where all eight of my players are going in our uh, two teams of four as sort of like a, a a testing but they're hiding they're hiding lists until after wtc list sub so uh, it is what it is yeah poland does the same thing i think there is a tournament here in poland that um the polish team is going to participate in together with scotland denmark Holland yeah, that's some other great countries. idea. And it's also like lists are all hidden and so on just for testing yeah. and stuff. It's incredible how the community has developed to come up with those ideas and so on. And uh, speaking of community development, uh, there is one thing that 
has been very prevalent over the, the last couple of years, I guess. Like if anyone follows football or soccer, so the proper football, um, you would see and you would notice and you would understand that uh, the, the level of information that you can gather from a football game, the level of data, the amount of data that you can gather from a soccer game is overwhelming. The, the commentator is the whoever is you know uh, telling you what the, what, the, what, the, what is happening during the game they have such an insurmountable amount of information about every player every team what, what the ball is made of what what, kind, what density of air is there in the ball you know shoe sizes penis length all that stuff the same is coming to the to to warhammer like the guys from stat check for example they gather so much info they gather so much data that it's incredible that you can actually collect all this and and collate this and present this in an understandable way so that's a very lengthy and long winding way of asking the question are you using that in any way in your preparation um no, uh, I, I, okay. I think it's the, the short answer. And so I, I, I say no again, um, not because I don't think data will be relevant. It's that I don't think there is enough sample size between 10th dropping and WTC for that data to have the veracity it once did. Like, for example, if we were playing 9th edition, we would be digesting that data, you know, hungrily um, you know, down here in Australia. But, but from my perspective, you know, and I, I say this because of like me being self-deprecating to myself that the data on Liam winning with Necrons, blah, 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 means nothing. Like it, it, it's actually almost completely meaningless. The data that, you know, I have a go second win rate of like 88% or whatever also means nothing because the missions are completely different. Everything's mm -hmm. changed. So I, I think that the data gathering is a really important part of teams and also international community building like it's cool to have that kind of competitiveness mm -hmm. with stuff like that unfortunately or fortunately depending on your perspective i don't think we have that for wtc because it's mm -hmm. it's just too close to the addition dropping yeah that's true uh so yeah there's not enough reliable stuff to actually take into consideration too small a sample size as they'd say in research so Maybe I mean, do your people use TTS in, in their preparation? Because you know, all the TTS leagues, I guess, they are kicking off pretty soon. So maybe that will be a source of that's true. Info. So um, one thing I will say, and I've got to word this mildly carefully, there are some. There is a group of about six of the people on the Team Australia team who, uh, a bit smaller than that, who are uh, putting together something quite unique this year, which I am really excited to talk about after WTC. Um, uh, which will be quite instrumental in analyzing some of the data that you've talked about um, that I, I think could potentially be a really big asset to the team. Um, but I, I will say no more on that front because <laughs> I don't yet know what it is. So. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, dig deeper into this. But what I would like to find out before I let you go is, um, again, it's not uncommon for teams to bring some extra stuff. stuff yes. Not stuff, but staff with them. Staff. Meaning some extra people uh, doing the work behind the, the scenes, um, you know, um, like the, the, there is a coach, a head coach. Um, I don't know who, 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 who else, but I know that last year your team probably had like four extra people. We did, yeah, like four. This. Uh, Poland, also a couple, but literally a couple. Um, uh, you know, running between tables, uh, checking stuff, researching stuff, passing over water and so on. Sometimes even like very mundane down to earth jobs like, yes, giving a player water so he doesn't dehydrate in the very hot uh, room. How many people are you bringing this year, if that's not a secret? And uh, again, what role they might be playing? We're bringing five this year. Five. Um, wow. So uh, again, you got to remember that um, I think the real you know, kings of this are the people who are coming as, you know, the coaching support crew. That's five people who are willing to fly over the entire planet to go and support eight sweaty nerds to play 40k. And not play the game, just run yeah. around them, basically. I'm, I'm strongly encouraging them all to play the Warmaster singles, so they will get something, you know, incredible out of the travel. Um, so w what role they play? So we found uh, in the 2022 WTC that the coaching support staff were, uh, we've always thought that those roles were important, 
but I, I literally think those are the linchpins of a team. I, I genuinely believe that this is not like lip service or should go on a poster saying we want you. I, I mean it 100% in the sense that in the WTC, the rules for communication and talking amongst a team are very strict. Having more coaching support staff allows ease of communication to the captain and tracking of a round. Leaving your table is a problematic and daunting prospect. Coaches reduce the likelihood you have to leave your table. Having at least four coaches means you can have one coach standing in between two tables. So that coach never has to move and is kind of like assigned a post, so to speak. Where they, if the tables are all in a line, they can just stand there, look at both tables. I think it reduces the likelihood of anything untoward happening. It means you can go pee uh, without, you know, worrying about the table. And probably, you know, also importantly, you know, water, food, things like that, that you actually need in these four hour rounds. It's pretty intensive. The last thing is that having that fifth person for us means we can have a dedicated person on scoring and tracking. So we can have coaches who are there to support the players and watch the games, and then a head coach who can actually coordinate and communicate with the captain in terms of like how to guide players if they're at points where they're not sure if they should push or play defensive or so on and so forth. I think actually having five coaches gives us a level of level of control over the round that I don't think we've ever had before. And also, Australians are freaking enormous. And when you see 13 of us at the pairings table, I think it's pretty funny. <laughs> Intimidating. Uh, yeah, I, but I know that many, many teams, uh, well, will follow your example. I think Polish yeah. team is also, Polish team is even bringing like a media guy this time because they came to yeah. the conclusion that actually, you know, um, playing the game, running around, and posting stuff on Discord it's too and hard. stuff. It's, it's, yeah, it, it is actually too hard. So they, they have a dedicated person to do that now. Plus there will be us, plus there will be some you know other people. There are even people coming without a role that are just willing to travel to, you know, uh, want to be part of it. cheerleaders for the team or something. So uh -huh. uh, it's incredible how this, how this thing is like bringing people together, which brings me to one of the, probably one of the uh, last questions of the interview. And then I'll let you go to actually you know, prepare for work. Um, is your community, sorry, the, the the Australian Warhammer 40k community very much like around the national team? Do, do people generally care about how well you fare, maybe after the, especially yeah. after the victory of last year? Or how, how does it work? Um, so I guess my experience is kind of like mildly in an echo chamber, you know, because like, uh, you know, especially as the captain and whatnot, a lot of my conversations with people are about WTC. So maybe I have like an artificial um, perspective on it, but I, I would say yes, very much so. Shortly after WTC, before I, um, before I was even the Aussie captain or anything like that, I went to Western Australia, basically as far away from where I currently live as a human being can go in the same country. For the record, it's a six and a half hour flight from one side of this country to the other. Anyway. Um, so I went there and there was a, a vast swathe of people there who I'd not really met or had conversations with, even if I'd met them once or twice. And like lots of people congratulated me. Some dudes took a photo with me and, and, and you know, uh, drank some beers, which I thought was awesome. And that's kind of persisted. Like, you know, people are pretty keen to talk and get involved, understand how Team Australia is going. But all of the anecdotal aside, stuff aside, l let's put some numbers to it, right? Because I think that how a country supports uh, a national team in anything is a good indicator of how much support there is behind it. For the 2023 team, I kicked off a big fundraising drive because, you know, it costs about $60,000 to send a team to Belgium. Um, it's a pretty expensive prospect. Um, you know, that's like a house deposit. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and so we did a fundraising drive where we, you know, called sponsors. We uh, did a raffle. Um, we had from spon we've had from sponsors well over twenty thousand Aussie dollars donated um, from some private companies, individuals, but also we have a brewery here who donated some cases of beer. Like I know nobody at this brewery. I just sent emails and they were like, "Oh, Warhammer, that's sick!" Mm -hmm. And they gave us some beer, so that was pretty random. Um, we did a raffle where we raised over five thousand dollars, just raffling off prizes for the team, things like objective markers and stuff. Five thousand dollars in raffle tickets mm -hmm. for a Warhammer raffle. We look. That only really pays for like one person to go. But I guess my point is that it's the greatest year ever for Team Australia community grassroots support, just in terms of dollars. 
people are willing to donate time effort you know people have messaged me being like hey if you guys need armies built and painted for wdc let me know and i'll get them done in a week like you know people I'm really, I guess, emboldened by this idea that I don't feel like I have eight or 13 dudes behind me, so to speak. I feel like I have like a whole country. Uh, it, it's really, really positive. Of course, when the, when the king reaches out to his people, Oh, here we go. <laughs> why wouldn't they listen? <laughs> Work for me, peasants. No, it's, <laughs> no, it's not like no, that. It's, it's more it, like... It's, it's, um, never yeah, like king. it's it's really, really good. And I think more than any year that I've definitely been involved, I, I feel like this attitude that we're going back to defend a world championship title has been adopted by even the friendly players at your local gaming store they kind of have this like this this ethos almost that aussies aussies are the best in the world let's go back and prove it and but in in a productive way not in like an angry way that mm -hmm. they, they they want to be better they want to get better um yeah so uh in the name of the international community, I, I guess I can say that to all the Australian people supporting you, chapeau bas and hats off because hats off to you because that's absolutely something wonderful. And I, I would like to see that in every single country that goes to the WTC at some point, you know, because it, it's it's, it, it's just, really it's a really awesome feeling. I, I'm not going to lie, and I, I I've also found you know anecdotally in singles events and stuff that I've played since WTC people's attitudes have shifted like like in all seriousness there's been quite a big i think um mood change in aussie 40k because i i think that now there's this sort of spirit of um people aren't just saying they're good you know what i mean like like for a, i do think for a long time you know people have been like oh yeah like aussies are pretty good at 40k now it's like oh okay like you know we, we can actually do things like yeah it's yeah, fantastic and then uh, the the last bit probably and and i will lead into you doing your plugs and so on but the last thing that i guess is noteworthy um or has been noteworthy over the last couple of years is like the advent of all the podcasts youtube yeah. channels and so on and so on where you can literally just sit down in front of your computer and, and hear listen to contact lost and find out what Pol polish players are doing what the american players are doing spanish french and so on and so on the world i think that's a quote from like in 80 days around the world the world has shrunk it's just yes. <laughs> way smaller and the world of 40k has shrunk even more so people play uh into like in, with in international teams on tts together everyone knows everything about everyone so i guess it also contributes to how well you can do and now liam to finish off uh and i'll let you go is there anything that you would like to plug uh very much so thanks thanks for that so um I, I do a podcast as you mentioned it's called the normal blokes 40k podcast it's a podcast dedicated to improving the competitive 40k experience uh the idea behind it is it's a couple of brisbane locals and we dissect new rules talk about tournaments our own experience it's very rarely a super high-tech in-depth stat or competitive analysis uh, it is geared towards people who want to become more competitive or who are already competitive and looking to uh, improve. But it, it's always geared at a, we're going to explain a lot of things from kind of the grassroots up. So if that's something that interests you, please hit us up. A lot of it's smack talk and, and me just insulting other people. Um, but I, I hope it's enjoyable. And, and the second thing is um, Team Australia is continuing to do its raffle and its fundraising drive. Uh, we are on raffle ticks if you search team australia 40k on raffle ticks website it is an online draw uh, it is at the moment australia only however for reasons beyond my comprehension the app allows you to just say wherever you are so for example we have people from new zealand who just said they live in queensland and if you win a prize and you do buy a ticket internationally i will ship it wherever you live so if you are enthusiastic we have something like uh, $3,000 of boxed 40k, two fully painted armies, some random cases of beer, which I don't think I can actually ship, so apologies for that one, uh, and a variety of other prizes, uh, including a, a moist handshake, uh, which we are raffling off for uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, and any support or support uh, would be really appreciated. We can actually no longer say that we are the furthest traveling team. Unfortunately, New Zealand beats us by about 150 yeah, kilometers. Um, so uh, but only the people in like south-ish New Zealand. There are there are some people in north that are, anyway, that's a, that's an argument for another time. <laughs> we digress. <laughs> so uh, thank you for, for that. So everyone who is interested in the Australian scene, the Australian 
lists of Australian players, go and check out uh, the Normal Dogs podcast. For me, as someone who is a podcast glutton, as I mentioned, I only recently found, found out that Hayden Waldock and, um, and Simon Gojkovic, if I pronounce that right, uh, they run the Ethos Australia 40k podcast, which is amazing as well, and I strongly recommend that. Yeah. And our good friend Sam Lemon is also running, I think, a fairly fresh podcast, but like he is very energetic and, and he also invites international teams. It's called Wide World of Warhammer. So yeah. I strongly encourage people to go and check that, as, uh, that out as well, because I've seen how much work that guy puts into his preparation. He digs out stuff and facts that I wasn't able to dig out, and that means something. So <laughs> go and check that out as well. Um, Liam, thank you. Uh, thank, thanks to your wife as well for you know giving you that time in the morning that you probably could have been spending together. Um, I appreciate that a lot. And I guess I'll get to speak to you at the event. See you in Belgium. See you in Belgium. Thanks a lot. And until next time. Bye bye. And stop recording. Mm -hmm.